Ladies and gentlemen, dear students, it's a great pleasure for me to welcome you at Technische Universität Berlin. And a special welcome to Jeff Dean. He has joined Google in 1999 and leads as a Google Senior Fellow, the department's Google Research and Google Health. Jeff, welcome to TU Berlin. It's a great honor for our university. Thank you very much for hosting me. I'm delighted to be here. My name is Christian Thompson. I'm president of TU Berlin. And we're very pleased as TU Berlin is the first university in Europe hosting such an event. And I very much think that our university is the right place for such events. For one, TU Berlin is a place for the young generation with over 33,000 students um, that grew up with emails, with internet, with SMS and WhatsApp and other technology, a generation which is almost never offline, but always up to date and eager to get at our university the best preparation for the tasks which will face them in the future a future which will change faster and faster. And secondly, TU Berlin is a place for creativity and invention of IT systems. This university is a place where science meets economy. In our school, electrical engineering and computer science, creative science work each and every day interdisciplinary on innovative inventions of information technologies. Thanks to close cooperation with industrial partners, it does not take very long until these inventions find their implementations. Speaking about creativity and invention, currently Tier Berlin is in the process of establishing the Berlin Institute for the Foundations of Learning and Data, bifold in short. It serves the purpose of bundling AI expertise in the capital and will be an AI nucleus forming research, education and innovation at the interface of big data and machine learning. As a scientist, I think it's particularly important and also right that the technological foundations are also very significantly researched and developed at public universities. Tier Berlin will gladly make a significant contribution to this. But let me now return to the reason why we have come here together today. Today, Jeff Dean will give us some interesting insights of Google's recent exciting research. For example, machine learning's potential for healthcare, robotics, language and understanding. Jeff will also discuss with us how machine learning is transforming aspects of our computing hardware and software systems and sketch out a vision for the future of responsible machine learning models. Dear Jeff, we're very much looking forward to your talk. May I virtually hand the stage to you? Thank you very much and good evening to all of you. Good, good late afternoon. Uh, I'm delighted to be here uh, to um, address the students and other members in the audience. And uh, uh, with that, I'm going to launch into a talk and then we'll do some questions after that. So let me um, get this going. Here we go. Wonderful. Okay. So what I'm going to be talking to you about today is how can we tackle grand challenge engineering problems through the use of deep learning? Uh, and this is work by many, many people across Google Research and Google Health and the rest of Google. Um, so I do not want to claim this is my work entirely, but uh, these are areas that I think are, are really exciting. Um, so deep learning is this kind of modern reincarnation of uh, artificial neural networks, which have actually been around for many, many years. Uh, the idea of having simple trainable mathematical units that work together to solve complicated tasks is not a new one. Uh, it's been around, you know, 40 or 50 years. But what is new is that we've suddenly finally arrived about 10, 12, 13 years ago with enough computational power to actually solve real world interesting problems uh, with the, this kind of approach. And I think one of the great things that we've seen is tremendous progress across many different areas of traditionally fairly difficult areas in, in computing um, that have now been amenable to uh, being tackled with deep learning. So for example, if you think of a deep neural network as learning very complicated functions from data, um, you can think of uh, image recognition uh, or image classification as a very complicated function that wants to go from the pixels of an image to what is in that image, that's a leopard, uh, or from the audio waveforms of uh, raw audio recordings 
to a transcript of what is being said. How cold is it outside? Um, so these neural network functions can learn very complicated functions from data. Uh, and so if you uh, think about image classification um, or speech recognition or language translation, or indeed even complex things like being able to write a short sentence describing an image um, from the raw pixels. All of these things are things that deep neural networks can actually, can actually do. Um, and the progress in the last 10 years has been tremendous. If you think about image classification, in 2011, the winning entrant at the Stanford ImageNet Challenge, which is a measure of sort of image classification accuracy, won the challenge with 26% error. This was the year before anyone used a deep learning based approach to image classification in this challenge. Um, and we know that human error on this task is about 5%. So there is quite a large gap there. Uh, but in 2016, through the use of deep learning for five years in this context, we've now driven as a community, driven the error rate down to 3% uh, error, which is tremendous progress and really means that we've gone from machines not being able to see very well to all of a sudden they can see and perceive the world around them and can uh, both uh, tackle computer vision tasks, speech recognition tasks, language tasks in really interesting and surprising and powerful ways. So um, the rest of this talk, I'm gonna frame around some discussions of how deep learning can be used to tackle some of uh, the challenges on this list, which is a list of 14 areas that the US National Academy of Engineering published in 2008 of grand challenges for the 21st century. And I think if you look at this list, we'd all agree that these are really important areas for us collectively as society to be tackling. Um, all the items listed in red are areas where we have uh, work going on within Google Research or Google Help. Uh, and I'm gonna be talking to you about uh, the three listed in bold at the bottom. But I think these are really, uh, if we were to make progress on even some of these items, I think we can agree the world would be a better place. Okay, so one of them is restore and improve urban infrastructure. And I think one of the ways in which we uh, see this playing out in the future is through the use of, uh, uh, for example, autonomous vehicles. So this has been a dream for many, many years, but through deep learning, we've now been able to build systems that can do a much better job of perceiving the world around them, understanding you know, what are all the different kinds of obstacles in the road, other cars, other uh, pedestrians, bicycles, uh, what are the traffic signs saying, and what are the regulatory framework in which uh, the car should operate as well as how can it make safe decisions in order to navigate the world. And I think um, really this is gonna be transformative to how we think about building urban infrastructure or cities, right? You wouldn't need as many parking places, your car might come get you with just the right number of seats in it for the, you know, just you or you and, and others. Uh, I think that's a pretty exciting uh, development and it's uh, getting a quite close to rollout. We have some rollout in a few cities around the world now. Uh, if you think about robotics, you know, that's another area where uh, robots so far have mostly been confined to operate in environments where the environment is very clean and where it's very well understood, things like factory assembly lines. But through better perceptive capabilities, we're now starting to be able to make robots uh, learn to do new tasks kind of uh, flexibly rather than being hand coded to uh, do those tasks. So here you see a, a demonstration of a robot. It gets to see some short videos of humans pouring things and then uses a reinforcement learning algorithm to attempt to mimic the behavior that it's seeing in the videos. And I would say after about 15 minutes of practice, uh, the robot is able to pour at perhaps four-year-old human level, maybe not eight-year-old. Uh, so that's, that's pretty exciting. Um, and we're also seeing things where we can combine modalities. So for example, you wanna be able to combine language in how you instruct a robot to do things with other perception that the robot sees and, and performs. So in this case, there's some nice work uh, that's been happening on essentially enabling humans to teleoperate. So humans can actually control a robotic simulator and can play with the robot in this environment of a desk with some things on it. Um, and then in hindsight, after they've 
done some playing, they can say, oh, how would I have wanted to have instructed a robot to do this task? And so they might say, in hindsight, I would have said, open the door. And using this data, uh, the, you can then train on these image and language goals so that the robot can learn from instructions like open the door to go from the starting image to the goal image. And once you've done that, you then have a model that can actually follow human language. And in particular, if you combine it with a language model that is uh, multilingual, you can command the robot in many different languages to do different actions. And so here's a brief video of uh, that happening. You know, you can see drag the block out is being said in Italian, pull the drawer handle all the way in Italian, and the robot is doing that in Polish, pull the drawer handle all the way, put the block back in the drawer, uh, push down the green button, uh, press on the red button, and so on, and tie. So, you know, we think combining language understanding and perception is a really interesting and, and uh, promising area in the future. Another area that we're excited about is advancing health informatics. Um, we think the use of, of uh, machine learning to tackle important areas in healthcare is a uh, promising one that's going to really transform how healthcare is delivered. Um, and if you think about medical imaging uh, problems, you know, there's lots and lots of different modalities of medical imaging uh, things that we care about. So in retinal images or uh, x-rays or mammographies, skin disease, and so on. Some of these have 2D images. So if you think about uh, relatively simple 2D imaging uh, acquisition, uh, that's what you see on the top row. And then if you think about more complex kinds of, of uh, scanning devices, uh, like uh, 3D uh, CT images, where you have essentially stacks and stacks of images that represent a volume of space in terms of, uh, for example, x-rays. Um, that's kind of represented by 3D volumes of images. Um, and in some cases, you get a single view, which is on the left-hand side here. And in some cases, you get multiple views of the same kind of uh, the, the actual uh, sample from multiple different uh, orientations. And there's lots of excitement about this. So, you know, it, these are sort of recent news headlines. AI is learning to read mammograms, is being able to detect lung cancer. Uh, but, you know, there are lots of questions in how you think about how should health uh, AI be used in healthcare. When it goes wrong, who is responsible is a question one news article is asking, for example. Um, so I think there's a lot of excitement here. Uh, there's a lot of challenges that need to be addressed in order to get to real world clinical settings at scale, but we're starting to see deployments in some uh, clinical settings to get better understanding of, of how this uh, uh, can be used to really aid clinicians. Um, so it needs to be data efficient, generalizable, safe, and fair. Um, and one of the things that has worked well in other uh, areas of uh, image classification and image detect, uh, uh, object detection, for example, is just supervised uh, training. And this is no different in, in medical uh, problems as well, where you have some labeled images. So you have, might have a retinal image and a clinician has labeled that as, you know, this is a severe case of diabetic retinopathy, or this other image shows no condition, no signs of diabetic retinopathy. And you can train a, a deep neural network to do the, a classification task on that kind of data. And that works uh, quite well. Um, and there's lots of different things you can do. If you don't have very much data, you can pre-train it on other kinds of images so that you get good visual representations uh, to start with, uh, and so on. Um, and so that's a really cool and strong combination um, when the task and the data permit it. Uh, but the problem is that good supervised labels for problems we care about may not be very cheap. There may not be very many images labeled with the kinds of outcomes or, or uh, uh, classification labels that they would want. So one of the things we've been exploring in many different areas of machine learning is how can we use self-supervised data to help in cases where we don't have much expert labeled data. And this is, uh, I'll, I'll show you an example of this in the medical domain, but if this is a generally good trend in the world of machine learning is how can self-supervision help us build good representations of things in the world that we care about. Uh, and self-supervision is really a form of learning where the data itself, not a human, provides the supervision signal. 
And so if we think about this medical imaging pipeline again, instead of having a supervised loss, we're now gonna have a self-supervised loss where we train the model on some self-supervised task. So for example, we might want to be able to take an image and then predict the colors from it because we believe that will give us good representations that are good at predicting other things we care about uh, from an image. Or can we hide a bit of an image in the right-hand side and instead uh, have the rest of the model fill in the uh, rest of the, that, that hidden part of the image from the context that it has in the rest of the image. And there's uh, a nice paper on contrastive learning for visual representations uh, by the authors you see there, uh, where essentially you wanna maximize the agreement of representations under some transformation of the data. So you wanna make two versions of an image, uh, result, of images resulting from the same source maybe you have a zoomed in version of the dog's hind legs and a, zoom, and a picture of the dog's front legs, you'd like to make those images agree more in the representation than these two other randomly selected images of a chair. And essentially you wanna repel those things from being near each other and attract the representation learned for things from the same, drawn from the same actual example. Uh, and that works quite well. In some cases in medical imaging problems, you actually have multiple views. So for example, you might have a view of a person's hand from one angle and from another. And in that case, you can work to, to train the model to maximize agreement so that these two things give the same outcome. Uh, if you don't have that, then you can essentially transform the image in some way, maybe rotating it and use uh, try to maximize agreement of the uh, original image and the transformed image. And this works quite well. So if you compare for several different medical uh, problems, uh, I'll note the y-axis here does not start at zero, but these are pretty significant differences in a lot of these problems. Um, you can actually see that self-supervised approaches give a pretty significant boost over purely supervised approaches because they can learn from data themselves. Um, and in particular, there's a few areas where this is really important. One is uh, if you think about the self-supervised approach here, which is the blue line as well as the yellow line compared to a purely supervised approach, which is the green line. Uh, if you look at the um, difference in the fraction of labeled images that we actually use to train the model, with roughly 20% of, of the images, we can get to the same level of accuracy as using 100% of the images with a fully supervised approach. And if you look at even lower data regimes, where maybe you only use 5% of the actual labeled images, you can get to a much higher level of accuracy than a supervised approach uh, using that, uh, uh, that number of labeled images. And so we think this is especially promising for medical uh, areas where you may have very limited uh, amounts of labeled data. And so the takeaway, I think, is that we need better models in order to deploy these AI-based diagnostic methods in the real world for many kinds of problems. Uh, they should be data efficient, generalizable, safe, and fair. Uh, recent advances in self-supervised learning are really promising and suggest this is one of the ways that we're gonna be able to tackle this. Okay, uh, so many advances that we'd like to make depend on being able to understand text. And so uh, we've been working in this space for, for uh, quite some time because text is sort of integral to understanding information, which is one of the core uh, aspects of Google's mission. Um, and there have been recent encouraging improvements, I would say, in language understanding using machine learning. Um, so in 2017, a group of Google researchers came out with a, uh, a paper called uh, Attention is All You Need that introduced a, uh, a technique called the transformer model uh, which was essentially a not a, a model that can uh, tackle uh, understanding text from large amounts of context. Um, and this was uh, recently named number four on Nature's 2020 list of the most influential scientific papers published between 2015 and 2020. Uh, as an aside uh, of how much AI and machine learning is transforming not just computer science, but all areas of science, the first non-AI paper on this list was number five. Um, so one of the great things about the transformer model compared to the previous state of the art of recurrent neural networks was that it was able to get much higher accuracy with 10x to 100x less computation. Um, uh, and that's a really important thing because you wanna be able to train textual models on more data 
and be able to get higher accuracy from, from that data. Uh, and in 2018, another group of Google researchers built on top of the transformer model uh, a system called BERT, which is, stands for Bidirectional Encoder Representation from Transformers. Uh, and BERT models are trained in this really interesting self-supervised way, where you take some original data, uh, just some text, and you randomly remove some of the words and force the model to try to guess what are the missing words from the rest of the context that it has uh, of the words that were not hidden. And this turns out to actually be a surprisingly hard task. Like if you look at the first blank here, Obama was blank in 1961 and Honolulu, Hawaii. You know, as a human, you're like, well, I don't know, what could it be? It might be born, might be, you know, lived or was, uh, you know, uh, uh, based or something. Uh, but you have some sense of what words might make sense in there. And so this is the way that self-supervision can really be powerful for understanding text. Um, and the key thing that works extremely well is you pre-train a model on this self-supervised uh, fill in blanks task. And then you can take that model and you can fine tune it on an individual ta language task uh, that you care about with small amounts of data for that task where you might not have very much labeled data. The other thing we want is bigger models, but perhaps we want to sparsely activate them so that we can have a very large model capacity to remember lots of stuff, but we want an individual example to only activate some very small fraction of this model. Uh, if you think about how your own brain works, you know, you have many different pieces of expertise and you're calling on a few of them at any given moment and can call on other ones in other contexts, but don't need to sort of expend the power and energy to fully activate all parts of your brain at once. And I think that's a good analogy for what we want in machine learning models. Um, and so in uh, 2017, a group of researchers, including myself, uh, worked on a technique called uh, mixed, sparsely gated mixture expert slayers, where you essentially can have a traditional neural network in pink here, but then you can have a mixture of expert layer where you have a very large number of experts where each expert has some parameters in the model uh, and you have many experts, but where you only activate one or two of these experts for any given example or context. Um, more recently, other researchers have, at Google have combined transformers plus this mixture of expert style sparsity, which you see on the right hand side in the, the red rectangle, um, and scale to give pretty dramatic translation uh, quality improvements. Um, and if you look at this, this is work uh, that's called G-Shard. Um, and one of the things they were able to do was train a very large model to, to be able to translate from 100 different languages uh, rather than training separate models for each one of these languages. And by combining this multitask uh, goal of training on many different languages simultaneously, we were able to dramatically increase the accuracy. So blue score is a measure of accuracy of translation quality and change in blue score is how much the improvements were for different languages. And the languages here are ordered, the 100 languages are ordered uh, from languages where we have a lot of, of data for them. So things like uh, German or Spanish or French uh, to uh, on the right hand side, languages where we have very few examples in the training data for those languages. And one of the nice properties you see is that languages where you have very low amounts of data actually showed greater improvement in the translation quality uh, because they're able to sort of generalize and learn from other similar languages. And because this model is sparsely activated, it's actually able to get these tremendous uh, improvements in accuracy in translation quality with only one tenth the training cost of a dense model shown in the dotted line here. Another thing that's really important when uh, building models for language is to really understand what, how is the model working and what is causing it to, to interpret things in certain ways. And so one of the things that's been done in the, the Google Berlin office, uh, as well as uh, other uh, Google research offices is building tools for interpretability of, of machine learning models. And the language interpretability toolkit really enables us to take these models, which build high level representations uh, of, of words and sentences and phrases and understand, you know, what aspects of particular parts of language or the input 
are causing the model to behave in a certain way. And so, for example, this lets us say, I think I like this movie. The model can then highlight the parts of the sentence that says why this particular phrase is getting positive sentiment and can, can help machine learning researchers and others understand this uh, better. The other thing about transformers is they're not just for language. It turns out they can be applied to many, many different kinds of problems. And one of the pieces of work that's uh, been going on in our Berlin research office as well as Zurich and Amsterdam research offices is applying the transformer to computer vision, the division transformer. Um, what we were able to see is that this approach of using a transformer instead of the more traditional convolutional neural networks for images actually enables these models to train faster than most other kinds of uh, vision architectures, which is pretty exciting. Um, so one of the goals of uh, the Na National Academy was to engineer the tools for scientific discovery. And I think one of the things that's uh, happening is um, we want to be able to automatically solve machine learning problems. And so AutoML is a, this approach of how can we teach machines to learn to learn. And so the current way in which we typically solve a machine learning problem is we have some machine learning expertise, we have some data, we have some computation, and we sort of store all this together with a human sort of defining a bunch of experiments to run and looking at the results of those. And we hopefully then get a solution to a problem we care about. Um, can we turn this into something where we use data and computation to sort of automatically drive the experimental process and come up with solutions for problems we care about? And an example of this is a technique called neural architecture search that uh, uh, a couple of Google researchers, uh, Berzoff and Kwok Lee, uh, published in 2016, where uh, essentially we're, the idea is we're going to have a model generating model, and we're going to train this model to generate uh, neural network architectures, and we're going to then see which architectures work well, and train the model generating model via reinforcement learning. So the basic loop looked like generate a bunch of models, train them for a few hours, and then use the loss, the accuracy of these generated models as a reinforcement learning signal so that we can steer the model generating model towards models that tend to work better and away from the part of the space where it generating models that don't seem to work as well. And then you essentially repeat this many, many times and you get interesting new architectures from this approach. The really great thing about this is that it turns out that uh, computers are very good at optimizing this kind of function, and we can come up with model architectures that are much, much better than ones than even the best human ML experts have been able to come up with um, across many different kinds of modalities. So here, if you look, we have uh, image ac net accuracy on the y-axis and the amount of computation it, for a variety of different kinds of models. Uh, for example, on the x-axis. And what you see is the, the dotted gray line is kind of the best human-generated model architectures over the last five or six years that people have been able to come up with. And then the dotted blue line is from an AutoML paper published in 2017. And the dot and the red line is from the uh, more recent work in 2019, which shows that you get dramatic improvements in accuracy with much lower computational costs for these models because these models are able to come up with very uh, highly effective architectures for computer vision. And the same thing is true in object detection. So again, we have machine learning expert based models uh, on the bottom, and then we have an AutoML based model on the, the top here uh, showing higher accuracy at lower inference times. And in language translation, the same thing is true. If you take the transformer paper uh, and you sort of give the basic components of the transformer to an AutoML system, it can actually come up with ways in which to put together those components in a more efficient and effective way for tackling language uh, tasks. And in this case, we're able to come up with models that are more effective at language translation. So the red dot here at a, point A is what we call an evolved transformer because it used an uh, evolutionary objective function. And B is kind of the base transformer. And A is slightly higher accuracy, so it's a little bit higher on the y-axis. But more importantly, it's quite a bit over on the left on the x-axis, meaning it's more efficient and environmentally friendly, and we can use less computation to tackle uh, future NLP uh, language problems. And this has been released as an Apache licensed open source implementation 
Uh, and if you're using transformers in your work, you might want to try the Evolve transformer, which you can uh, in that open source release. And one common myth about these AutoML or neural architecture search uh, approaches is that you run this expensive search every for every new problem you care about. And that's actually not generally how one does this. Really, you run the search once per problem domain and architectural search space combination. And then you reuse the results of that across many, many problems. So for example, the implementations of efficient nets and efficient uh, object detection nets develop VNS uh, have been forked 4,000 times on GitHub by people all over the world to tackle their own machine learning problems. Okay, uh, the other uh, aspect of deep learning is that it's really transforming how we think about designing computers. Uh, and in particular, uh, neural network algorithms have two Im really important properties. The first is that for most of the algorithms that you see that I've talked about today, reduced precision is okay. So, you know, just like you, it's for easier for you to multiply uh, numbers with less digits of precision. That it, and that same thing is true for computers. You can actually have much more efficient sort of multiplier circuitry to do reduced precision arithmetic. And then the other property they have is that there's a handful of specific operations that these algorithms are composed of in different orderings. And so if you can make essentially uh, uh, vector, uh, vector operations, matrix operations, uh, dense linear algebra, and so if you can make um, systems that are really good at reduced precision linear algebra, uh, that's going to be an amazing uh, computational platform for deep learning, and you don't need to worry about making other kinds of things uh, fast or even implemented at all. And so uh, we've been developing custom chips called tensor processing units, TPUs, for many years now, um, where we've been making uh, successive generations that are able to sort of have impressive uh, floating point operation per second uh, numbers and really enable us to tackle larger, larger problems. Um, we also have been building them with kind of custom interconnection networks because we want to be able to throw more than just a single chip worth of computation at some of these problems. And so instead, we, we want to be able to have a whole bunch of chips uh, and in the, the latest generation pod, TPU V3 pod at the bottom here, we have 1,024 of these chips work working together using a custom interconnection network. Um, and TPU v4 uh, is kind of the latest generation of these chips, and you see some results in uh, ML Perf, which is an industry standard benchmark for performance of uh, machine learning uh, chips and systems. We you see sort of TPU v4 gives a roughly 2x speed up over the or more over TPU v3 in the ML Perf training. Uh, version 0 0.6. Um, okay, and I'm going to close with a vision for where we could go. I think one of the things that's really important is what do we want? We would like large models sparsely activated, kind of like a mixture of expert style work. We want a single model that can solve many tasks. We know that you get tremendous efficiencies from being able to train a model and then reuse the representations that have been learned for many related tasks. We want to dynamically learn the model architecture, I think, uh, and grow pathways through a large model as we start to add new tasks to the model. And we want the model architecture to adapt as needed. So I have kind of a cartoonish diagram here of what this might look like. Uh, let's say we've trained a very large model with many different pieces to it, and different tasks here uh, have inputs and outputs uh, on the bottom and the top of this diagram. And we've learned good ways to go through the model and use some of its pieces, kind of like the way we've learned which experts are good at which different things. And then a new task comes along. So a new task here in the purple, we might want to be able to search over the space of possible ways to go through the model in order to get into a good state for the problem, the new problem we care about. And so maybe we find that this particular path through the model is effective at giving us good results for this problem. And maybe we want to do even better for this problem. So we add a bit of additional capacity to the model and start training it to do even better on the purple task. Now notice this new piece can now be used for solving new tasks or maybe is even useful for tasks we've already learned how to do. So I think this kind of approach of a very fluid and dynamic system that can do many things is going to be an interesting direction in the future. Um, the last thing I'll close on is 
thoughtful use of AI in society. I think as we've seen many, many applications of machine learning and AI, uh, it's really important to be thinking carefully about how we want these systems to be applied to problems. And a couple of years ago, uh, we actually came out with a set of principles by which we think about uh, applying machine learning and AI to different problems. And um, you know, the seven principles we've come up with are listed here. I, I'm really happy that we have these principles out in public and that we've sort of have uh, been using them to steer and uh, make decisions about our own internal uses of machine learning. And by publishing them, I think we give others who are also thinking about these same kinds of issues some, uh, you know, um, some sense of how we think about these issues. And I'll point out that many of the areas here are really vibrant areas of research. So for example, we've published more than 100 papers in the last few years on machine learning fairness, bias, uh, privacy on machine learning data, and safety of machine learning systems. So these are things where there is a current state of the art. We'd like to advance that state of the art, but also apply the state of the art as it exists today as we're thinking about applying uh, machine learning to different problems. And so with that, uh, I hope I've at least giving you a taste that deep neural networks and machine learning are helping to make headway on some of these grand challenge problems in the world. Uh, and uh, thank you. More info about our work is at our website. Uh, and there's a blog post there that gave a more detailed review of some of the work we've done in 2020. And with that, I'm going to conclude and now take a few questions. Thank you so much, Jeff. This was really inspiring and yeah, Fantastic that we have time for three questions. I hope we can cover all of them. And first of all, thanks to all the students who submitted questions. And uh, the first question we can have is from Bin Bin Zhu. Hello, can I be here, heard? Yes. Okay. Uh, hello, uh, thanks a lot, Jeff. Uh, thanks a lot for your very nice talk and uh, the insights you have been given. And uh, um, because I'm a PhD student uh, from TU Berlin, and I also have the research interest in digital learning. So as we know that the Google has been uh, investigating a lot to applying the AI and ML in speech uh, comprehension and the speech recognition. And how do you imagine the trend of its application, especially in Google's language translation products? Thanks a lot. Yeah, very good question. I mean, I think we, what we've seen is tremendous progress in the capabilities of speech recognition systems through the use of deep learning to uh, perform better on lots of different languages, to perform better in kind of noisy environments and so on. Um, and also to, through progress in uh, uh, sort of NLP and, and language modeling tasks to do a better job of understanding uh, these kinds of, um, you know, what, what is being said, as well as to do a better job on producing high quality speech output. And if you think about what you really want is you want a conversational agent where you speak to it in your voice, it understands what you've said, and then is able to uh, reply in a voice and perhaps even do translation online of speech in, speech out. And I think putting all those pieces together, we definitely see that this is a direction that is going to dramatically improve in the future. I think if you look at the G-sharp results that I showed of um, the improvements in language quality, uh, language translation quality, those kinds of things will really dramatically improve translation for many different languages. So I'm, I'm excited about the future. I think all these pieces are, are making progress and putting them together makes even more progress. Yeah, thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you, Bin Bin. Now the next question is from uh, Kastub Bedgar. Yeah. Uh, hi, Jeff. So thanks uh, a lot for your talk. It was really interesting. So uh, my question is, how do you, how does Google ensure different? Uh, it's a degree of sensitivity towards various aspects such as cultural, demographics, or even geography. Uh, in, in various uh, AI-based uh, products? Yeah, this is a, a really good question and a really important area. I think, um, you know, this is one of the reasons that we've put forth a set of principles by which we think about these kinds of issues. Uh, and some of the ones that you highlighted are very specifically about 
things that the AI principles touch on. And so I think uh, the way we, we generally think about this is you want to make sure that you're testing your models for different kinds of biases that you think might not be uh, good to have in your product or in the application of, of AI. And I think one of the things that we're all aware of is that if you train a model on data and that data comes from biased sources, maybe it doesn't represent the full geography of the world or it only represents certain speakers of certain languages, those kinds of things can lead to bias in the outcomes of the model. And uh, it's really important that you have a uh, sort of consistent way of looking at these issues and thinking about how do you actually test for bias, how do you actually correct for it. Sometimes the correction is, you know, making sure that your data is representative of all the different ways in which your model will be used. Sometimes there are algorithmic things you can do in a model, even if you trained it on bias data to eliminate certain kinds of bias. So this is, I would say, a very deep and open area of research, as well as, you know, careful application and measurement and understanding of what these models are doing in how we want to sort of uh, make sure that we're doing the right thing now, but also advancing the state of the art and how we tackle these issues. So, thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot again for the question. And we have a final question from Elena. Uh, hello, Jeff. Thank you for the great talk. Uh, my question is more about career. So imagine you would finish university this year. What would be your dream job? Would you go to academia, join a startup, or go to a big company? And maybe also the industry. Yeah, uh, good question. I mean, I think uh, as students graduate, they often have questions in their mind about what should I do next? Uh, and I think, you know, the right choice for any individual uh, really is a matter of some careful introspection into what is important to you. And those, the, the different things you listed all have different uh, sort of uh, kinds of, of work that are enabled. But I think to me, the most important thing is that you pick something that you're really, really excited about, that you think your work will make a difference in, in the world and how, you know, your work and work with colleagues is used. Uh, and that you put yourself in an environment where you're sort of continuously learning as you do work, right? I think the, a very easy thing to do is to take a job and then work in a particular area for a very long time. My own personality is that I, I like to sort of work on something that I think is important for a while and then find something that I think I will also benefit from to kind of transition my work in that area into another area um, so that I can continuously learn new skills and learn from colleagues who know things that I don't. And I think in all the different settings you, you listed, there are definitely ways to set yourself up so that you are continuously learning new things and are applying your expertise to make a difference in the world. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you so much to all the students submitting questions. Thank you, Jeff, for the tech talk and sharing some insights and also thanks again to TU Berlin for hosting this event and yeah. Yes, this. thank you. Thank you all very much. And uh, I, I, I hope everyone is staying safe and healthy and uh, thank you for hosting me at TU Berlin.